This is such an important topic because, you know, think about where you're at, either as, a, as an individual or as a clinician. You're trying to help yourself, you're trying to help your patient, and the information out there can get so confusing and so polarized, and it can leave you almost sort of paralyzed. What do I think? What do I believe? What's truth? What does this mean for me? And that's one of the hardest questions to answer, either for an individual, what does this mean for me, or as a clinician, what does this mean for the patient I'm seeing right now? And that's the part that takes time, it takes careful thought, it takes work, and it's not easy, and that's why a lot of clinicians don't like to do it. Busy clinicians, clinicians who follow the guidelines, you're gonna hear me talk a lot about the blue penguin, and you're gonna see why I talk about the blue penguin, because we're all blue penguins, so more on that. But first, um, my disclosure is I don't have any financial ties to pharmaceutical, diagnostic, or medical device companies. I'm the medical director at dietdoctor.com, and I do tele, uh, telemedicine consults and get some book royalties, but those are my disclosures. I always like to start with this slide because, like I said, if you think about what you want for yourself or what we want for our patients, this is it. This image is what it means to me, this, this image of vitality and life and energy. And does this mean a perfect LDL? Does this mean a flat glucose curve? I don't know, probably not. You know, not having heart attacks, not having amputations, that plays into this. But it's more about the life we live and the enjoyment we get and the overall health we have. And that's something I think we lose as physicians um, when we follow guidelines, when we think so carefully about individual numbers. So I always like to bring people back to this image. But here's the problem. We've been taught that this is the way to achieve that. Eating this is going to get us there. Okay, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but this is basically what our recommendations and our guidelines have been. Eat less, move more. And obviously it hasn't worked. We hear time and time again, it hasn't worked. Why hasn't it worked? Well, a big reason could be it's just hard to follow. We are emotional human beings. We feel hunger, we feel emotions, we feel cravings. Is this gonna do anything for that? Of course not. So that comes back to that image of living the life of energy and vitality and living a life that we enjoy. And this doesn't get us there, but this could, right? And most doctors who look at this would probably say, okay, I'm all right with that. You know, I, I think that's healthy. However, they define healthy, whatever criteria they use. And a lot of people can achieve great health with this, but the problem is they can with this as well. But doctors are going to see this very differently. Why? Because there's saturated fat in there, there's animal products in there, and that's, that's the problem that we have to cut through, where we have to start seeing people as blue penguins and cut through this sort of general blanket um, beliefs and, and, and dogma that, we, that just isn't serving medicine well. So we know low carb works. Like None of this up here on this slide is really debatable. But what does it mean that it works? Well, for lowering blood sugar, it works as well as or better than comparable diets. For weight loss, it works as well as or better than comparable diets for the average person. For hunger, it's going to work as well as or better than comparable diets for the average person. And the same for body composition, right? And the same for triglycerides and HDL and all these other medical conditions. It can work. Doesn't mean it works for everybody. Doesn't mean it's the best thing out there. But the point is, if your doctor, your clinician isn't discussing it as an option, or if you as a clinician aren't considering it as an option, you're leaving a whole treatment off the table that really could help hundreds, thousands, even more people. So we have to start talking about it in the right way as a potential option. But what about the LDL, right? That's like the one thing that's keeping this from going, just blowing up and going mainstream in the medical community, the fear of fat and the fear of LDL. So how we talk about things are so important. So there's this myth that low carb diets are dangerous. And anytime one of these studies or reports or reviews gets in some journal, it just goes crazy over the internet. I'm sure you've seen it and it drives me crazy. So low carb diets are dangerous is the myth, but how do you define low carb? So I wrote this piece for Diet Doctor a little while ago. What is a low carb diet? Don't ask Harvard. And it was meant to be a little inflammatory because the Harvard School of Public Health is classic for putting out these papers talking about how low carb is dangerous. And they define low carb as 40% of your calories from carbohydrates. Right? 
on a 2,000 calorie diet, that's about 200 grams of carbohydrates. So how many people in this room ate 200 grams of carbohydrates this week? In a whole week, how many did it? Right, and they're talking about that as per day that defines low carb. So it's, it's willful, it's either ignorance or willful misleading, but whatever the case may be, it hurts the message. It hurts the message for clinicians who don't have the time to dig into it. It hurts the message for individuals who get scared by the, by the headlines and say, look, why would I wanna get involved in this? I'm just gonna skip over it, because it's dangerous. So it really hurts the message. Um, and then even further, this one was a more recent one by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which by the way is fabulous marketing. Calling it Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is just fantastic marketing because even if you go to their website, you can see they're, they are an animal rights and a vegan um, organization, but they couch it as responsible medicine. I'm not sure how that works, but they, they wrote this, this review, Ketogenic Diets and Chronic Disease Weighing the Benefits Against the Risk, and it was everywhere in the media. And what did they do? Well, interestingly, they did start by defining low-carbon keto diets and defining them sort of appropriately. But then they pulled evidence from all over the place. They pulled evidence from these studies of 30, 40% carbohydrates as a low carb diet and tried to couch it as evidence either for or against a keto diet. They pulled from these observational studies that had nothing to do with low carb or keto diets. So it was incredibly misleading. And, and so I did a review on it on our Diet Doctor channel on YouTube. And the point being, you know, their report got you know, millions and millions of views shared all over the media. The rebuttal, my rebuttal didn't, but the point is we need more of this. Again, we need more of us standing up to say, well, hang on a second, we need to be clear about our message. So how low carb is low carb? Well, at Diet Doctor, we define it this way, and they're, you know, it's not set in stone, but this general concept is what we need to talk about. Strict low carb or ketogenic, less than 20 grams of net carb or 30 grams of total carbs, moderate low carb, 20 to 50 grams of net carbs, and liberal low carb, 50 to 100 net, net grams. And when we look at the literature, when we look at the science and say, does this represent low carb? This is sort of, should be somewhat of, of a guideline. So for individuals out there who are confused, when you see something say low carb is dangerous, the first question you have to ask is how do they define low carb? So the myth that low carbs are dangerous, low carb diets are dangerous is absolutely not true. Low carb diets are not dangerous. When you define it correctly, there's no evidence to support it. But ah, uh, the fat and cholesterol, right? Clinicians uh, and individuals, we've been taught time and time again that fat and cholesterol are dangerous and they cause type two diabetes and they cause heart disease. Well, there's also just a, a recent um, article talking about high fat dairy, how it certainly is not linked to uh, incident of type two diabetes, but those things die hard. And here's a study, you may recognize some of these names, Dr. Finney and the wonderful Dr. Halberg, and the, we owe a big gratitude of debt to them for the, the science that they're putting out, the literature they're putting out with properly defined low carb terms. And not only does it not cause type 2 diabetes, it cures and it can reverse and can prevent. This was a study in um, people with prediabetes and showed the progression to type 2 diabetes on people not limiting their fat, not limiting what they eat, but reducing their carbohydrates, that 52% of them with prediabetes had normal glycemia in two years. 52% in two years went from prediabetes to normal glycemia. We can't do that with drugs, but we can do that with a diet that does not limit fat, does not limit um, animal products. And so, again, it's, it's part of reframing this message. And when we talk about saturated fat, your cardiologist, if anybody's seen a regular cardiologist, saturated fat is dangerous. Well, which saturated fat are they talking about? And where are they getting their evidence? Because when you look at studies, demonizing saturated fat, talking about the dangers of saturated fat. Which ones are they talking about? Because I can guarantee you, your body is going to see this plate of pasta with this meat sauce that also, by the way, has sugar and a whole bunch of other things in it. Your body's gonna see that much differently than this salad with some, with some beef on top. So which saturated fat are they talking about? Same example here. Um, I call this a, a food delivery system, this big, <laughs> This big chunk of bread bigger than your head is your food delivery system. That's the food. Why don't we cut out the food deli delivery system and just eat the food? And also this concept of healthy user, healthy user bias or unhealthy user bias. Who do you think is more likely to eat saturated fat in this photo? 
And who do you think is more likely to otherwise take good care of themselves? Who's sleeping better? Who's managing their stress better? Who's got better social connections? Who's, you know, maybe seeing the doctor more, or taking the vitamins, or just prioritizing their health? Well, clearly, this person's going to be taking better care of themselves than this. I do not want to run into this guy in a dark alley. But the point being is if you're not controlling for that, and there's no way you can control for everything they're doing in their lives that make them healthy or make them not, they make their choice, and one is going to be choosing saturated fat more than the other. So the evidence that we're basing our decisions on have nothing to do with low-carb diets and people eating healthy and living healthy lives. And that's where that, that report by the PCRM um, that was so misleading because they couched it as if they're talking about low carbon keto diets and then they pull in all these observational data that have nothing to do with it because it can't control for this. So that's what we're fighting against to get this message straight that I want clinicians to understand, that I want you to understand so you can talk to your clinician about it because that's how we have to start this education process. And this concern about saturated fat it's not just an observational study. So the, this was a, a, review, uh, a, a review I did about a, a post um, from the Cochrane Media, which reviewed all the, sorry, the, the Cochrane Review, not Cochrane Media, Cochrane Review. They reviewed all the randomized control trials on saturated fat intake. And there was no difference in who lived or died in terms of who ate more and who ate less. There was a very small difference in cardiovascular events in terms of who ate more and who ate less but it was only significant if the LDL went up, okay? So, and this was in groups who were not eating low carb. Again, this had nothing to do with low carb. This was high carb, high fat, mixed diets, high calorie diets. So all of a sudden, as you peel away the levels of the onion, you start to see that this concern about saturated fat, well, okay, observational trials shouldn't really count. Well, what about the randomized control trials? Well, okay, it's only for cardiovascular events. Well, actually it's only if your LDL goes up. Oh, and it's only really been studied in, you know, these high carb, high fat, high calorie diets. So how any of this applies to us as the blue penguins, and I promise I'm going to show you the blue penguin slide here soon, that how, how any of that applies to people who, are, who don't fit those criteria, that's where we all need to be treated as individuals and demand that our clinicians treat us as individuals. And I guess all of this wouldn't really matter if we weren't talking about something that was beneficial. So this is an old slide, but one that just really highlights the benefits so, so well. The, the dark blue is the low carb diet and the light blue is the low fat diet. And body mass, better on the low carb diet. Abdominal fat, right? And we don't wanna just lose body mass and body fat. We wanna lose visceral fat, abdominal fat. That's the fat we wanna lose. Better on the low carb diet. And look at triglycerides, much better. HDL going up. And then of course the triglyceride to HDL ratio, not even close. I've never seen anything that can do it this well. Um, in terms of lifestyle or medications. And then ApoB to ApoA1, which is like a better marker than LDL to HDL ratio. In the PURE trial, over 170, or sorry, PURE study, in over 177,000 people, observational, it did show that the ApoB to ApoA1 ratio was the most predictive for cardiovascular risk. Um, not LDL, but the ApoB to ApoA1 ratio, and that gets better on a low-carb diet. Small LDL gets better, and then, of course, glucose and insulin. Could you imagine if a drug did all this? Could you imagine if a drug did all this? How, like, how quick your doctor would be to prescribe it for you? But it's not a drug. It's a lifestyle. But the question is, what about the LDL? And so is LDL really a concern with low carb? And my answer is no. And then, well, probably not. We got to be a little cautious about this, but mostly no. So let's talk about that. So first, let's look at the science, right? So in, in patients who are being recruited for weight loss or for treating type 2 diabetes, a meta-analysis in over 1,800 patients at 6, 12, and 24 months, up to two years, looking at these 1,800 patients, there was no difference in LDL for those treated with low carb or the controlled diet. No difference. And this is, this is what our concern is. And we have more recent evidence too. Um, this one actually from Dr. Weiss and, and from um, Dr. Little. Not only did this study show that LDL particle size got better, but when you look at the LDL particle number themselves, there was a reduction in LDL particles. I'm gonna say that again. This was 38 randomized trials looking at 1,700 participants for a carbohydrate restricted diet versus a control. The LDL size went up, which is important, but the LDL particle number went down. 
This is the opposite of what most doctors and most cardiologists think happens to LDL when you go on a, a low carb diet, but it actually went down. And this is what we need to start talking about. Your doctor needs to learn about to share this message. And it wasn't just that trial. So uh, Lucia Ronica and Chris Gardner from Stanford have been kind of unpacking this diet fit study. And what they found was when you look at how much cholesterol people ate, when you look at how much saturated fat people ate, the highest versus the lowest quartile, there was no difference in cholesterol. There was no difference in how much those who ate the most versus those who ate the least and what their LDL did. So that's why when I say, is LDL really a concern? The answer is no, and here's that famous blue penguin I love talking about. So when all the world is gray penguins, when all you see in, represented in, in studies and in guidelines are the gray penguins, but you're the blue penguin, what do you do? You've gotta find somebody who's gonna think outside of the gray penguins, who's gonna recognize you as that blue penguin and treat you appropriately. And if you're a clinician and you think all you see are gray penguins, it means you're missing the blue penguin because they are out there, we are all out there. Blue penguins are all out there and need to be treated appropriately and thought of appropriately. Now, what about hyper-responders, right? So those trials that I um, was, ta was talking about that did not show a significant increase in LDL, those were in people trying to lose weight and in trying to treat their type two diabetes. Now, of course, we know a subset of the hyper-responders that Dave Feldman's been so great about promoting. Um, they certainly exist, but is LDL problem for them, and certain, thankfully for Dave and, and his research, upcoming research, uh, we're soon going to know a lot more about this, so I encourage everybody who is eligible to sign up for that. But we already have evidence to say we need to think differently about this, that not all elevated LDL is the same. So this is from, this is an old trial back from the 80s, from the original Framingham heart data, and if LDL was the same for everybody and a concern for everybody, what you would see is as LDL increases on this line, the risk of cardiovascular events would skyrocket. But here's 100, 160, and 220, and there's no difference in cardiovascular risk. Now this happens to be at a elevated, or at a what should be a normal or high HDL. And as HDL goes down, now all of a sudden the high LDL starts to have its risk. But you know what else happens? Even with a low LDL, as HDL goes down, you start to have a high risk. So what this clearly shows is not all LDL is the same, right? It doesn't mean you can ignore it. It doesn't mean it means nothing because this is still the worst place to be over here with a high LDL and low HDL. So it doesn't mean it means nothing, but it clearly means it's not the same for everybody and in every situation. And that's not the only data we have to suggest that. This is from the 4S trial, which was a statin trial using simvastatin in patients who had had a heart attack. Um, and it showed a significant benefit to treating with statins uh, in terms of reduced mortality and re reduced cardiovascular events. But look at this. So this is what's called the lipid triad. So for the patients who had high LDL, low HDL, and high triglycerides, there was a significant difference. These were treated with statins and the these without, you can see significant difference in the outcomes. But look at the isolated LDL. Those who did not have low HDL did not have high triglycerides. There's basically no difference. And you can see it graphically here. The, the white circles and squares were the lipid triad and the black ones were the isolated LDL and they're, they're right on top of each other. So evidence already exists for us to at least question whether high LDL is the same for everybody, right? Not whether it's meaningless or means everything, but whether it's the same for everybody. And here's a more recent one. This one actually blew my mind. And, I, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but like why weren't more people talking about this study? So this one, I'm sorry, it's a little small there. But what they looked at was people who had a calcium score at time zero and had a follow-up calcium score 10 years later. And there was a percentage of people who had LDL greater than 190. And 54% of them had a persistent calcium score of zero 10 years later. And these were patient people who were in their 60s. So it's not like they're in their 30s and 40s. You wouldn't expect the calcium score to go up. They were in their 60s. But not only did, did half of them not increase their calcium score, but had the highest proportion of persistent calcium score equals zero. I had to like shake my head out and read that again to make sure I, I was getting that right and I didn't misread something. Had the highest proportion of, of persistent calcium scores greater than zero. So even people who had lower 
LDL were more likely to progress their calcium score than people who had um, LDLs greater than 190. Now, again, it wasn't 100%, right? It wasn't 100%. But that alone, I don't know why more people are talking about that, saying, well, hang on a second. Maybe we're getting a little aggressive here and treating all elevated LDL the same. But the reason why, it, it's really archaic that, we're, that we as cardiologists and, and lipidologists are, are probably the worst of this, to, to say um, all LDL above 190, all elevated LDLs concerning, it's because this fear of familial hypercholesterolemia. The trials that included people with LDLs greater than 190 in the past didn't really screen out for familial hypercholesterolemia. And the point is, you, you don't have to memorize this slide, but the point is, this is there's a criteria for diagnosing FH. And it has to do with, what is your LDL, of course, but do you have physical exam findings? What is your family history? Family history of cholesterol problems or family history of premature coronary disease? And there's also this, the Dutch criteria. So that was the Simon Broom criteria. This is the Dutch criteria. There's a genetic analysis. But look, it's complicated, right? You, it, depending on how many points you get. So. The, the point of, of showing this slide, again, is not for, for you to understand the criteria, but to say if you as a clinician are diagnosing somebody with FH because their LDL is greater than 190 full stop, or if, you, if your clinician has said that to you, your response should be, well, what's my Simon Broom score? What's my Dutch score? And if they give you sort of that glazed look in their eyes, say, Google it because it's there, because clinicians need to know this, because not all LDL is the same. And if you have a familial or a genetic reason for it, it's very different than if you have a lifestyle reason for it, especially if you're seeing tremendous other benefits from that lifestyle. And then putting LDL into perspective, this is one of my favorite slides. The, um, this actual slide was put together by the folks in Nutrition Network. I love how the colors pop, so I had to, I had to borrow it. But this was looking at the, the Women's Health Initiative, and 21-year follow-up data. So looking at what, what factors they had at the beginning of the study, and 21 years later, which of those factors correlated most with risk of cardiovascular events? And LDL is there, right? And that's why we, it's not that we can ignore LDL, the hazard ratio of 1.3. So it was there. ApoB, better. And so this is my, my little advert, my, uh, my pr public service announcement that really we should be talking about ApoB. We should never even be talking about LDLC anymore at all. We should be focusing on ApoB because the, the literature is just better. The risk is better, but we're so ingrained with LDL. Uh, the testing is so easy. The guidelines are all around it. The, the shift is, the ship is starting to turn. It's just going to take a little bit longer, but that's the direction we need to go. But anyway, um, so the risk was there, but now look at this almost five times higher with a hazard ratio of 6.4 was this lipoprotein insulin resistance score. So factors that are more associated with insulin, resistant, insulin resistance and metabolic disease above and beyond just what your LDL and your ApoB is. And it was almost five times more predictive, which is very impressive for a study like this. I mean, when you look at observational studies and hazard ratios, you know, below two, you really have to question whether it's even a legitimate finding. But when you get up into the sixes, all right, now we're talking. Now that's a legitimate finding that's worth some attention, even from an observational study. And then, of course, when you look at the diseases that were related to it, type 2 diabetes was number one, um, and metabolic syndrome number two. So pretty impressive. That helps reframe what we're talking about when we're talking about cardiovascular risk. Um, and this is shown very nicely, again, familiar names, Dr. Volek, Dr. Finney, um, Dr. Hallberg. So thank you again so much for the contribution. Although my one take, just for, as a little aside, I love when I can get up here and talk about a trial and say, well, the ACCORD trial showed this, the Look Ahead trial showed this, the COURAGE trial showed this. What type of title is that? I can't come up with a catchy headline for that. So I don't know if I'm going to complain one thing about all the great science they're doing is you guys need better titles. Okay. Anyway. So. So what their trial showed was, um, using the carbohydrate restriction at one year, there was LDL went up by 10%, okay? But there was a 12% decrease in their calculated risk score. Now, remember that Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine paper that I, I referenced? So they were, in that, there was a section about LDL, and they quoted this paper, and they quoted how this paper showed a 10% increase in LDL. And I'm reading it, and I'm starting to get big eyes and like, oh, great. Next, they're going to talk about how the overall cardiovascular risk was decreased. 
And I kept looking and I kept looking and I kept looking, but of course it wasn't there. All they mentioned was that the LDL went up. They failed to mention that despite the LDL going up 10%, the calculated cardiovascular risk went down. And that goes back to that prior study that shows how cardiovascular risk is so much more than just LDL. And how did they do it? Well, there was no change in ApoB, the better marker for cardiovascular risk. There was no change. How could there be no change in ApoB when the LDL went up? Well, remnants probably went down, so the VLDL, the IDL, but also you decrease the small LDL, right? And this is, this is important because we have studies, um, retrospective studies that show if you look at uh, quartiles of small dense LDL and cardiovascular risk, the higher the quartile of small LDL, the higher the risk. And when you, at least in this study, when you look at the larger LDL, there was not the same differentiation. Also, the ApoB to A1 ratio decreased, which I had mentioned previously, the triglyceride to HDL decreased, and the large VLDL. So this is the remnants that also are atherogenic particles that have ApoB that we don't talk enough about, but if you're talking about ApoB rather than LDL, you capture these. So the cardiovascular risk went down despite the LDLC going up a little. So we don't have to get into this argument, well, do I focus on metabolic health or do I focus on cardiac health? Who's gonna win the tug of war? Because they are one in the same. And that's also, I think, a tide that is starting to shift to a degree in medicine. People are starting to talk about cardiometabolic um, medicine, and that's, that needs to catch on more as well. But it's data like this, science like this, that's going to start to help, help further that. And then, of course, I want to take shift for just a second to talk about further evaluations, right? Because if we are blue penguins and we are outside the guidelines, the evidence that inform the guidelines maybe don't represent us. We need to say, what else is out there? Well, calcium scores are certainly one of those. And, and thankfully, in 2018, the cholesterol guidelines recognized calcium scores as the power of zero. If you have a zero calcium score, there's no benefit to treating with statins. And this is um, from a study out of, out of Walter Reed. And for people with a calcium score of zero followed over 10 years, whether you treated with, them stat with a statin or not, there was no difference. There's supposed to be two lines there, but it's actually right on top of each other because there was no difference. So if you are seeing a physician or if you are a physician and, and um, LDL is high immediate statin, first make sure you know if you have FH or not. What is your Dutch criteria, your Simon Broom score? Second, put it in the context of your overall metabolic health. But third, if you want more testing, say, what is my calcium score? Because the power of zero is there. If it's not zero, it gets a little more complicated, but still can be very helpful. It needs to be individualized, but can be very helpful. But the power of zero is there. I also want to make a plug for CT angiograms. And if I was giving this talk, you know, five years ago, I probably wouldn't be talking much about CT angiograms because the radiation dose was significantly higher than a calcium score. But as happens with technology, that radi radiation dose has been coming down more and more. And look at just how beautiful these pictures are. I mean, so this will show up on a calcium score, but all you'll see is that dot. You won't see anything else, but you can see the whole lumen of the vessel. This is beautiful. So you can see that that calcium is really causing no problem with the artery itself. And you can see how beautiful these arteries are. This is a pretty, pretty normal um, CT angiogram. And you know, I was doing CT angiograms I don't know, for 15 years. And when we started, the, uh, the radiation was, was quite high. It could be up to, you know, 10 millisieverts and a calcium score is one. So it's about 10 times uh, what a calcium score is. Now you can routinely get these for four millisieverts, only four times what a calcium score is, which is about your radiation exposure on a, a cross-country flight. Um, it's a little strange correlation, but that's about what it can be. Um, so definitely worth considering because you can see things like this. Like, so here's calcium, right? But what you don't see on a calcium score is that you also have this soft plaque. So you can see how it's dark. And this is the higher risk situation where you've got the calcium and the soft plaque, so a mixed plaque, or you've got this sort of napkin ring right here without much calcium. That's the higher risk situation that you would treat very differently. Can I go back? Yes, you would treat very differently than just a speck of calcium 
with no soft plaque involved, no luminal involvement is vo involved. So when you're talking about what is my risk now, what is my risk five years from now, what is my risk 10 years from now, these are two very different scenarios. So that's why I'm now starting to talk more about CT angiograms because calcium scores show calcification only, CT angiograms show calcification and soft plaque, calcium scores don't show the artery lumen, the CTA shows the artery wall and the lumen, and that's important because a lot of times when you get calcium, it actually is, it can be what we call positive remodeling, which means the wall starts to expand outward, not inward, but outward. And that's likely going to be less of a concern than if it extends inward and has the soft plaque. Um, calcium scores are quick tests, probably less than five minutes total. CTAs are longer tests and may take up to an hour because you need to be monitored before and after. They might have to give you medication to slow your heart rate down because they're very sensitive to, to faster heart rates. Again, newer technology is improving upon that, but not everybody's going to have the latest and greatest scanner. So it may be a longer test. Um, calcium scores are still acceptable at a faster heart rate. Lower heart rates are better, but to a degree, faster heart rates are okay. Whereas for CTA, you need a slower heart rate. Calcium scores are cheap, are cheap relatively, $75 to $250, depending on where you get them. CTAs are going to be much more expensive, if not covered by your insurance, anywhere from $750 up to $2,000. There's no contrast with a calcium score, but there is an iodine-based contrast for a CT angiogram. So you got to make sure you don't have any allergies before you get it done. Uh, low radiation, one millisievert, anywhere you could say between two and eight for CT angiogram. It is dependent on, on body size, body weight. Um, but this is catching up. So I guess the point is it's catching up. And if you're not sure what to do, it's actually very timely. I just had a discussion in the back of the room there. Um, someone with a calcium score ended up getting a CT angiogram because the calcium score wasn't great. And then how often to follow the CT angiogram. Of course, it's very individualized. But there was a time where I would have said, no, you can't follow CT angiograms. It's too risky, too much radiation. You don't want to get it over time. Now that's changed. So start talking and thinking more about CT angiograms. So uh, my favorite blue penguin, we all deserve to be treated like blue penguins. If we're physicians, we need to look and treat people like blue penguins because the guidelines are just guidelines. And they come from data that are from huge data sets um, that for, are for the average population. And for most people, if you're concerned about your health, if you're proactive about your health, if you're following a healthy lifestyle, you're not the average person, unfortunately. I wish that was the average person, but that's not the average person. And of course, it's not all about nutrition. We spend a lot of time talking about nutrition, but physical activity, you know, um, not the best for losing weight, but very good for maintaining weight loss and absolutely crucial for proper weight loss. Losing lean body mass, maintaining or gaining, sorry, losing fat mass and, and maintaining or gaining lean muscle mass. Protein's important, exercise is important. Same for sleep. Um, not only does it affect your hormones, your cortisol, your hunger hormones, it also affects the brain, the big nugget on top of our heads that sometimes works for us, sometimes works against us. When we don't sleep, it tends to work more against us, I think. Uh, same for stress and, of course, social connections. Uh, so here's the goal, right, for us as physicians to help people achieve this type of life, for us as individuals to achieve this feeling of joy and energy and vitality. And it might have nothing to do with LDL and might have everything to do with the lifestyle that you lead. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Um, I have an integrative primary care practice and if time allows, I have four questions for you because I'm worried about my patients. So the first question is, do you, is an elevated calcium score enough to get a CT angiogram paid for by most insurance carriers? Or, you know, yeah. I usually try metabolic syndrome, prediabetes with that too. Yeah, so payment, uh, insurance payment in the U.S. for CT angiograms is, is usually going to be chest pain with a non-diagnostic stress test. So short of that, it might be a struggle. And that's part of the problem with recommending CT angiograms. Um, it, for most people wanting to get one for prevention, for lifestyle management, um, it's likely going to be cash pay, unfortunately. Yeah, it, it's really for diagnosis of angina as far as insurances are concerned. Great talk, Brett. Thanks, Dave. So 
Uh, I did want to capitalize, obviously, there's a reason we chose CT angiograms for our study. And yes, exactly what you're talking about before, um, I'd gotten one in 2017, and even in just the last four years, which by the way in medicine is like an eternity, um, there's really, there really has been a lot of advancements and a lot of the modern machines are both higher resolution and lower dosage. Uh, the one that we got, I actually did a test run with Lundquist, and mine was and when I say this, just know it's not standardized. It depends on your body mass and the existing calcification, et cetera. But I was at around two millisieverts. Yeah, that's and great. That, and of course, that was like a no-brainer because free living, a lot of people don't realize this, is roughly like three millisieverts and just like background radiation. So that, that tends to be something I think a lot of people should consider. And I did want to fit in one more thing, and I think you'll likely agree with me on this. Even though, like me, you are cautiously optimistic we can never emphasize enough that everybody needs to do their own research, figure out between themselves and their doctor what their best choice is. Um, I would want to be sure that everyone felt comfortable with whatever their LDL levels are, wherever they're at in their own health journey. So, so yeah. Dave, I just wanted to say something. You used to be really good at phrasing your statements as questions. <laughs> <laughs> just, just say, do but, you agree? But you kind of lost your touch. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Com you said, do you agree? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> comma. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> you know, that's an excellent question, Dave. Thank you for that question. <laughs> but, but I would say, you know, if, if you can qualify for that study, then you don't have to worry about insurance paying for your CT angiogram, so even better. I know. <laughs> I'm totally hoping Dave picks me for that study. Um, <laughs> pick me, I wanted, pick me, pick me. I wanted to ask a question. Can you raise your hand in here if you're any discipline of healthcare provider? Please raise your hand. Okay, I just Very want good. everyone to know you'll never see a conference where you've got all these different disciplines in healthcare sitting in one room, socializing, talking, networking. You say blue penguin. I like to say unicorns. Um, you guys are all unicorns, and I, I hope you realize that because what we're trying to do and the change we're trying to affect and realizing over time that we have to work together as a team to make this stick and continue to go, like just know that you guys are total unicorns, we all are, and just keep doing it. I want to give a unicorn talk next year. But didn't the American College of Cardiology come out twice last year, or am I confused, and publicly say that, oops, we've been targeting LDL all this time, but maybe we were supposed to be looking at carbs and sugar. I read two things last year. Well, so it, it's, I, I think what you have to be careful is saying, what does the American College of Cardiology say, and what does the Journal of the American College of Cardiology publish? So, so there were some position statements and reviews published in Jack yes. that were um, saying the data does not support uh, the, the, the push for reducing saturated fat. But that is a far cry from saying that the American College of Cardiology supports that supports in their guidelines. That. So no, they have not come out to support that. But it is a huge victory that they're at least publishing something, one paper by Dr. Ronald Krauss and others, um, that, that are questioning it. So for that to be published in, in the country or maybe even the world's most preeminent cardiovascular journal is huge. Do, um, do we know if they're doing anything further with that or was it just a bleh and now we're done? <laughs> Well, so um, fortunately, Dr. Krauss has been very involved in the ACC and the AHA and, and their guidelines in the past, so I'm hoping he still has their ear and is making progress, but I, I'd be very surprised if they make any changes in their guidelines or recommendations. But like I said, it is, we, I think we do have to consider it a victory that they're at least publishing um, papers about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Brett, for your talk. Uh, so as a family medicine doc, I... I um, it, the CAC score has become more a part of my practice, and I, I'm very appreciative of what it's been doing, and I've, there's a lot of patients that have benefited from it. My question pertains to, let's say a, a patient has a high score, uh, they don't have any symptoms, they don't have any chest pain with exercise, they just have medium risk, and they've, you've kind of done a history on them. Um, so the question has two parts. One is, um, in the past I've had um, cardiologists say, if it's a high score, jump straight to a stress test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, knowing what I know from your talk today, um, 
especially in women, when you know that nuclear scans can be a tremendous amount of, in a stress test, can be a tremendous amount of radiation compared to what you're demonstrating yeah. here with the CT angiogram. Yeah. Would it then be maybe, at least for women, f to reduce the risk of breast cancer uh, from, from a high radiation scan, would it be better to, to maybe start with going from a high CAC score to, to go to a CT angiogram and push for that instead of straight to a stress test? I yeah, guess. great question. So th this whole concept of elevated calcium score goes straight to a stress test came from a study that showed um, those who had calcium scores above 400 had a 30% chance of having a positive stress test. Now, positive stress test as your outcome sounds kind of scary, but it has nothing to do with who has heart attacks, who lives, who dies, who even has angina or functional limitation. And, and that's a bit of a change because anybody would say, whoa, ischemia, positive stress test, that sounds awful. But that doesn't mean you need a stent. That doesn't need, mean you need treatment. So that's, that's part of the disconnect, um, I think, in that, in that rationale. And, and some guidelines even say it. So there, there's a disconnect there. So I, I don't think you need to do that. And yes, depending on the score, I would say for most people, a calcium score, I mean, a, a CT angiogram may be a better test. The one caveat is the higher the calcium score, the lower the diagnostic yield of a CT angiogram because the, the X-ray beam can't penetrate the calcium well. So if you have a couple areas with big chunks of calcium, you won't be able to see the artery behind it very well. Now, again, as technology improves, that improves, but it's never gonna go away completely. So where is the threshold? Hard to say. But certainly as you get in up to these really high calcium scores, you know, a thousand or more, CT angiogram may not be very beneficial then. So there is that caveat. But I think in general, it might be a better test than a stress test for someone who is physically active and, and, um, and not having symptoms and doing well otherwise. And the other reason I worry about, about with going straight to a stress test is if you're seriously considering someone has three vessel disease, mm -hmm. the stress test can have a false negative because of the distribution of the, yeah. of the, of the flow to right. all three impaired arteries. Right, so, we have to yeah. recognize that stress tests are not perfect tests. And, and so what they do, they can tell you if you have a, about a 70% narrowing or more. So it won't tell you a thing about 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% uh, plaque buildup, but a 70% narrowing or more um, that becomes symptomatic when you are exercising that your heart's not getting enough blood flow. And you're right, especially in nuclear stress tests, there's this concept of balanced ischemia, that if you have three vessel disease, it can miss it. Um, you know, there are ways to, to prevent against that. But every, every stress test has a false negative rate. That's true. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Of course. Thank you for a great presentation, Dr. Scheer. My Thank name's you. Tina Carlson. I'm a retired scientist, so I love how you get into the, the detail and the, and the, the papers. Um, my question is this. As a lean mass hyper responder, I saw my LDL obviously go up quite a bit, and my nurse practitioner at the time that I was working with became convinced I had familial hypercholesterolema. And I argued with her, I have, as a scientist, my blood work going back to my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And it was like 180. So my question to you is, can you actually have FH and have it show up later in life? Because that's what she was convinced, and I just yeah. argued to heck. And I had a CAC score of zero at 61, so that calmed her down. But she was still convinced I had FH, yeah. and it made no sense to So me. good question. Can you have FH that shows up late in life and not early in life? And, yes. I, and I guess the truthful answer is you probably can, but it's going to be pretty unlikely because one of the big criteria is age at diagnosis. Um, so that was the Dutch criteria, the Simon Broom right. criteria. Age at diagnosis plays into that for sure, as is degree of elevation. But so does family history, and so does genetic analysis. So we don't have to guess anymore. That's the thing. We can get a genetic test, which isn't 100%, but is going right. to pick up the vast majority of uh, genetic mutations that can cause familial hypercholesterolemia. We can look at our, our Broom criteria and our, our Dutch criteria um, and, and put it all in the context. So... It's, it, that's, I see that all the time, and patients come to me all the time. I'm, I was diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia, and their LDL when they were 30 and 40 was 110, 120. Right. That's not familial hypercholesterolemia, 99.9% .9 of the time. And that's what I thought. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. I'm a pharmacist that works in primary care. One of my scopes is managing lipids. So you see secondary, you see an event, secondary prevention, you're automatically thinking statin. That 4S trial blew my mind. So at the risk of confirmation bias, are you aware of any major other statin trials where you see the benefits only in that isolated, ele elevated LDL versus, you know, ha ha having the low trigs and high HDL not having a huge benefit from a statin, which is something I've never been taught. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Actually, to be, honest, to be honest with you, that's the only one I'm aware of. That doesn't mean others don't exist, but that's the only one for the statin intervention trial that I'm aware of that looked at that. And yeah. look, for, for secondary prevention, um, statins still have a role. I, I don't want to uh, imply that statins have no role. Mm -hmm. um, they can still reduce cardiovascular events in secondary prevention, but they're not the only treatment either. And, and I think that's the most important point to make. Um, and it, everything's a risk-benefit analysis. Um, in that particular trial, it was very interesting, the difference. And that was a subset of the trial, too, I should say. That wasn't, you know, in, in the whole population. They had to get the data that they had and, and, and filter it. But it's not in the drug company's interest to look at trials that way, right? And if the a lot of the statin trial isn't available for third-party evaluation um, and, and reanalysis, and that's a big problem as well. So, yeah, we don't have a lot of that data. Okay, yeah, thanks. That's not going to, like ignore the, you know, the, the benefits in secondary prevention, but I love the question generating curiosity point that that brings up yeah. that many of my colleagues would never think of. So thank you. All right. You're welcome. Brett, good morning. Steve Panelitas from Pennsylvania. Thank you for the bike tips. Uh, <laughs> my wife and I rode quite a bit this week, but would you get rid of the traffic before I come out the next time? Right, right. That's why I'm a mountain biker now. So yeah. So um, I'm no lipidologist, I'm just a dumb surgeon, uh, but I like to advise my patients, my uh, cancer patients, about adopting a healthier lifestyle. And I'm always very careful that I say I've suggested this book, that book, you know, low carbohydrate, but only do this, you know, um, in consultation with your family doctor. And I send mm -hmm. that to the family doctor. I'm a little confused about LDL, and I'm just wondering if you have a patient you know, whose LDL is creeping up, and you know the family doctor is just going to say, oh, you got to stop doing what that stupid surgeon told you to do because <laughs> look what it's done to your LDL. Um, what would you have that patient do as far as asking for an APOA to APOB ratio or a particle ratio? Because I can tell you right now, if I try to get into my EPIC EMR, and order one of those tests, I could not figure it out, and probably my nurses couldn't figure it out because, you yeah. know, we're not in a primary care practice. So what would you encourage a uh, patient to say to their family doctor to maybe get what lipid test to uh, get a little closer to what their true risks are? Never mind, you can quote, quote, Framingham and anything else, and you know, yeah. how would you go about doing that? Yeah, great question. How do you approach your primary doctor to get a more um, detailed look at your at your lipid labs? And I guess one answer is you don't need a doctor to get labs anymore. I mean, you know, there are direct to consumer labs that you can get without a doctor's um, without a doctor's prescription. And uh, was it own your labs? Dot com. I think I heard something about that. That's a, a nice site to go to to, to, get, um, to get labs done. And there are others out there as well. But you, So first is you can get the more advanced lipid testing without your doctor. Um, now you have to pay for it, right? That was not going to go through insurance. It, it can be tricky for insurance to cover it. But for me, um, I think the biggest argument is, look, the, the guidelines um, are geared towards do you take a statin or do you not take a statin. I want to know how my lifestyle is affecting my lipids. And one of the biggest ways lifestyle can affect your lipids is the size and density of your, of your LDL, um, which is not going to be picked up on necessarily by the, the standard uh, lipid test. And I want a better marker than just the LDLC, which is the ApoB. Um, and uh, or an ApoB to A1 ratio that those are, you know, I'll, I'll, you can explain the science and say, but it has to do with my lifestyle, not whether I'm taking a drug. And that's where a big differentiation comes in, in terms of, um, you know, where you monitor your response. So, yeah, I mean, there's no perfect answer, but it, it's just trying to explain it that way or just say, you know, I don't need a doctor. I'm just going to go to the internet and get it done. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, so if somebody got a CT angio and the results look terrible, would anyone qualify for invasive therapy? Like, what would you do with it beside optimal, optimal medical therapy? Like, 
PCI for someone who's as asymptomatic or cabbage <laughs> for someone who's asymptomatic. Uh, and it, the follow-up to that would be, if, if not, what is the use case for CT angio? Yeah, so it's a tough question. What do you do with an abnormal CT angiogram? Do you do... In an asymptomatic patient. Right. Do you do a stent or do you do bypass? So, so um, I, I guess the easy answer there is no. If someone is asymptomatic um, and they don't have severe triple, triple vessel disease or severe osteal LAD disease, then, I mean, the literature is, is very clear now that medical management is, is as good or better than invasive approaches and treatments um, unless someone has severe refractory angina. So in the absence of that, no, you don't need to do anything about it. But I think that, so the argument could be then why do it if it's not going to change your therapy, if you're not going to do anything about it? Well, it could inform medical therapy for one thing. It could inform, you know, whether or not you go on a statin. Um, could have, you know, if you want to make the decision based on soft plaque rather than just hard calcified plaque. It's not an evidence-based decision at this point, but there's reason to think that that might be a reasonable approach for some people. But the other thing is following it, because if your calcium score is going up, but you're calcifying pre-existing plaque that's in the same location, that is likely a different prognostic implication than if your calcium score is going up and you're seeing new plaques develop that are mixed soft and, and calcified plaque. To me, those are two very different scenarios, which a CT angiogram is gonna tell me much more about that than a calcium score would. So for me, that, that's the biggest reason to get it, I think, to look for progression or regression, right? If you had soft plaque before and now that's gone and you have more calcified plaque. Again, this is all outside of guidelines, um, you know, and outside of strong evidence base. Um, but to me, it makes a lot of sense and I, and I think that's a good use of the test personally. Thank you. Hey, Brett, how are you? Great talk, You're thank on. you. One of the concerns I have with a lot of these presentations is that they tend to be uh, about, out oh, sorry, they tend to be about outcome metrics, and outcome metrics tend to be very unifocal, and the decision-making capacity is binary. The slide I most loved that you showed was the transformation of your VLDL, APO, a, APO B to a LDL particle size uh, going down, a particle size going up. So, and is that not representative and I think this is where I'm changing my perspective. Everything you talked about was really about the so-called cholesterol in colloquial terms. Is the problem not the, the physiology and the pathophysiology of triglyceride production and, and transport? In other words, that change, the, the methodology that we're using here in a keto world is altering triglyceride production. It's a glucose-driven triglyceride production. And all of those changes that benefited us were because we changed the production of triglyceride that then needs to be transported. Are we not talking about the wrong animal? Are we not talking about cholesterol when it's somewhat less relevant than triglycerides production and the physiology and altering that with our dietary intervention? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. And again, the, the focus on LDL versus the focus on triglycerides. We've had actually a, a few papers published in the past year or two looking at triglyceride rich lipoproteins um, and how those correlate with cardiovascular risk better than LDL does. Um, you know, and if we talk about fatty liver, it's you know, triglyceride fat um, production in the liver usually fueled by carbohydrates is one thing. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. If we talk about wh um, why is triglyceride being created and how is it being used as the second side, um, that is probably a much more beneficial discussion than LDL, especially for someone who's following a low-carb diet, because we've changed our physiology. When you look at the general studies, the average, the studies that study the average person, they're not burning triglycerides for fuel. Um, they're burning, burning glucose for fuel, and their triglyceride synthesis pathway is very different than the average. Um, so I think that's a great point. And I keep coming back to that... Um, uh, PCRM piece um, because it was so egregious. But uh, when they talk about fatty liver, they had a section on fatty liver and they started that section by saying, well, for healthy people, triglycerides come from, you know, X, Y, and Z in different percentages. Well, if you're talking about someone with fatty liver, you're not talking about a healthy person. So why are you telling me where their triglyceride come from and their triglyceride utilization because it has nothing to do with someone who has fatty liver. So I, I think that highlights your point very well that we're talking about a completely different animal. Right, and really, I, you know, what we're looking at is that 
people on a high carbohydrate diet or even a moderate carbohydrate diet, their primary focus is the conversion of sugar to triglycerides in the liver transported to the fat cells. Mm -hmm. When you eat a high fat diet, chylomicrons transport that lipid directly to the fat cells and then distribute your fat from the fat cells to the body. And that determines triglyceride metabolism quite distinctly where you're really not transporting huge amounts of, of triglycerides when you're on a high fat diet, other than postprandially in chylomicrons to the fat cells. It's then uh, um, simple esterified fatty acids that you're releasing. Whereas when you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, the production center is the liver, where you're producing the triglycerides, your fatty liver, and then you have to ship them out to the fat cells and to the body. And that's where your lipid transport molecules change. And it's that dietary yeah. intervention that you showed there, which was, I, it was just a beautiful slide to show that our intervention seems to be working not on cholesterol, but on triglycerides. Yeah, yeah, your point, I think the take home for your point is it's a completely different physiology and we need to recognize that, yeah. Hi, Brett, good Hi. morning, and I, I hope that my English is better today than it's my second day in America. <laughs> <laughs> because yesterday I wanted to ask about inflammation of the endothelium, and hopefully Dr. Isman, uh, Eric Westman asked Dr. Finish and they helped me with all my questions. If not, maybe Pam can translate my, I can talk in Spanish and Pam can translate my questions. But now, to the point. Uh, don't you think the unstable plaques are soft and the calcified plaques are stable? So a higher coronary calcium score would be better than nothing? Second, can you with the angel can measure the density of the plaques. And the third question would be about the statins that are anti-inflammatory, and that thickness of the endothelium is inflammatory sign. So they, the, the industry, they say that the statins are anti-inflammatory and they reduce the density of the plaque, which are transforming those soft plaques to hard plaques or calcified plaques, which would be better and that would be healed, like uh, Dr. Sawyer said yesterday about the skin. Yeah. It's care. Yeah, gr great question. So um, uh, let's see how to address these in, in order. So the, um, is a higher calcium score better because it shows hard plaque? Well, see, that's the problem with calcium score, is it doesn't tell you anything about soft plaque. So all it tells you is that there has been a vascular injury and a calcific healing response that has happened. But it doesn't tell you what else is there. So that's why higher calcium scores correlate with increased cardiovascular events because it's just telling you burden of overall disease and, and injury. But that's where a CT angiogram can be much more helpful because then it will tell you which are calcified and which are not. Um, so if you can see non-calcified or mixed calcified plaques become more calcified over time, yes, I believe that is a good thing because the soft plaque doesn't just disappear, it has to sort of heal. And in that sense, the calcification can be a beneficial thing. So that's one of the problems with a calcium score going up is if you're not sure um, why it's happening. And so you can do calculations to look at density of plaque. So are there, are there fewer areas that are getting more dense with calcium or more areas that are getting little speckles of calcium? You can calculate that and looking at the images can help as well, but a CT angiogram can be very good about that. So the, the next question you asked was, can you tell the density of plaque? Yeah, you can just put your marker on it and get the Hounsfield units, which is just sort of the, the radiological term for what is the density of that plaque. Now the question is, does that correlate with outcomes and soft plaque and risk of rupture and risk of MI? Most likely it does, and that's really sort of a hot area of research right now is how to identify vulnerable plaque. If you just see a scan, which is the hot plaque, you know, you can do, some people are doing temperature scans by actually putting catheters in the arteries. With CT scans, can you use certain criteria um, and is, density can be one of those. So yeah, that is a hot area of research right now with the thought being that the, um, the softer plaque with the thinner cap, those are gonna be much higher risk and how to best identify those. So it's a great question. I wish I had an answer that this is the one thing to look for, but it, it's evolving. But yeah, that is something to consider for sure. And the both studies? reducing the risk? Oh, sorry, one more time? The statins, reducing the risk because they transform the density of the plaques to calcium. Right, so it, does that then that? reduce, so does, does 
transforming the soft plaque to a harder plaque reduce your risk of, of heart attacks or death long term. Uh, we need those studies. I mean, it, it, makes, it makes sense, but a lot of things that make sense don't always play out in, in the literature. So we need better studies to show if that is the case or not. And do you have any other idea of intervention to stop the development of a sclerosis to calcify stenosis? to stop the progression of atherosclerosis to cal right. calcified stenosis. Yeah, yeah, eat real food, exercise, get plenty of sunshine, get plenty of sleep, <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, just quickly, uh, Dr. Roberto Curanta is a great friend of ours. He came out in 2017 with his son Ignacio, and, and his other son, I'm very sorry, I don't remember his name anymore, but um, we had a raffle and he won a, a one of the prizes is a free ticket to the next event. Ah. You guys are shit out of luck, excuse the expression, but every single time he's been to events since then, he's won the raffle ticket for the <laughs> next time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emma Hett Nichols, and um, I'm a medical writer, PhD in nutrition from the low-fat era. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for your talk. I've got a little bit of an N equals one experiment going on. Um, my husband, he's doing a low carb diet very recently um, and he's got known heart disease. So last month his CAC score was 2700. Hmm. He's still alive, he's upstairs. <laughs> and, Not the heavenly upstairs, just the room upstairs. Okay, got it. <laughs> oh, right, yes. <laughs> So we're trying to document a reversal. I'm writing about it, and um, his blood, he's come off blood pressure medicines. He's, it's, all of that's getting better. He's insulin resistant, and we don't have many options. So um, I wanted to ask, so is it worth him to get a CT angiogram? He got a CAC score, and then what would be a good time period if we're going to do the CA CT angiogram? How, like, would we do it again next year? to see the benefit or what? So first, of course, is I can't give any personal advice, but I can certainly yes. give general recommendations. So um, when calcium scores get up above 2,000, uh, a CT angiogram, in my opinion, is going to be pretty useless because that, that's where there's so much calcium that there's just gonna be way too much artifact to get a, a meaningful test. Um, and even following calcium scores is going to be very difficult at that, at that score because there's just so, with that much calcium, there's so much blooming, so much artifact, so much to count that the inter-test variability is going to be huge. So, you know, every test has its limitations and, and at levels that high, um, I'm pretty skeptical that follow-up tests are going to be beneficial, unfortunately. So, um, I, I usually wouldn't recommend someone to keep testing. Now, there may be times where it does make sense and it can be done, but as a general answer, I don't think it's going to be very helpful. Got it, thank you. Okay. So, hey, Dr. Tesher. My, my name is Tony Martinez, and we're gonna be talking about this insurance issue. Medical necessity is what the whole issue is about getting these tests at 12.30 in the Harborside at my breakout. I wanted to ask you, do you know about the Theot, Patrick Theot, who, uh, the Theot protocol, and, um, which is to reverse plaque? Uh, I've been doing my own three, I'm going on year three, as an N equals one, and the very interesting thing that happened is last year when I did my CAC scan um, in the uh, LAD, it went down from 2019, it went down from 37 to 32, and my cardiologist really didn't acknowledge that, but she did acknowledge that, hey, you don't have progression, and that's a good sign, and I'm about to do another set of tests coming up because I get my annual physical, and we'll see uh, how that works. But I wanted to, and, and, and what is the role of vitamin K in all of this, because that's a key component in this Theot protocol. Yeah, great question. So first, first uh, my general thought on regression of calcium scores, and again, I'm pretty skeptical on it because first and foremost, it was a, a vascular injury and a calcific healing response. So I'm not sure if we wanna get rid of that in the first place. 
Now, lack of progression is certainly a good thing because it's suggesting that you're not having further vascular injury and healing response and calcific response. So I think, I think that is more the goal. But okay. when it comes to regression, that's where I really want to see CT angiograms because I want to see more about what's happening to that plaque rather than just a calcium score. Also, as a clinician, I can say, you know, anecdotally, I have seen a number of regression in calcium score where, where you compare the studies and the quality of the studies is just completely different. The heart rate's different, the way they measure the calcium is different, and you just can't compare, you're not comparing apples to apples. And that's something you won't get by looking at reports. You're only gonna get that by looking at the scans themselves. So that's the other reason why I personally am kind of skeptical about it. Doesn't mean it can't happen. I just think if we set that up as our goal, we really are confusing what the true goal is, and we're kind of setting ourselves up for maybe some confusion and, and, and potential failure. So I'd rather see a CT angiogram in that setting and see that improving rather than a calcium score. The, what is the role of vitamin K2? Yeah. Um, the role is we need more studies. We need a lot more studies on that. I love vitamin K2. I like giving it to people with vitamin D3 who have calcific coronary disease. It makes sense but I can't stand here and say it's evidence-based at this point. I mean, there is some evidence that can su suggest it can help with endothelial function, um, that it, it may reduce cardiovascular disease to a degree in some small studies, but we definitely need more evidence to support that. The, the other thing I can report in that study is I had bone loss in my, mouth, in my jaw from gum disease periods, and I went for a dental checkup, and my dentist looked at me and said, what have you been doing? Because yeah. the bone loss, it's gone. You're, you're recovered. You're like, it's great. Right. So the K2, Wait, so D, I said, I've been taking K2. Yeah, the, the theory behind D and K2 is it puts the calcium um, where you want it, in your bones, in your teeth, and, and doesn't put it where you don't want it. That, that's the theory behind it. And so there's, there's, there's very good anecdotal evidence to support it. Question two. All right, <laughs> she's back. So over the last year, I've done about 80 hours of evidence-based training in bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And one of the most disturbing statistics and studies that they presented, and I wish I could cite the specific study, was about statins and how they can raise blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that in women, that can raise their risk of breast cancer up to 30%. And what I'm thinking about is, as a primary care provider, a lot of patients come to me on statins, and if they're in that insulin-resistant, um, estrogen-dominant state already, as long as they haven't had a cardiovascular event and aren't a hyper-responder, possible familial hypercholesterolemia patient, isn't it reasonable to just yank them off that okay. statin as they're doing these lifestyle changes? Yeah, so, so great point that one of the main side effects and maybe most concerning side effects of statins is it can induce insulin resistance. It can make people more likely to develop type 2 diabetes, and which for a drug that's supposed to reduce cardiovascular risk is, is rather ironic, I guess you could say. So that is something that does need to be monitored very carefully. Now, one of the things I love about people who are living low-carb lifestyles and doing time-restricted eating and doing resistance training is those are all the things you do to prevent insulin resistance. So I think, again, no data behind that, but I think they're much more le less likely to get that side effect from statins than the average person. But yeah, trial off of statins to see what happens to insulin resistance to someone who's having a worsening course while on a statin, despite doing other lifestyle things to the contrary, I think a trial off of statins is definitely indicated in following tests like a HOMA IR or even a craft test or, or whatever your, your preferred method for following insulin resistance and sensitivity. I think that's definitely reasonable in a lot of patients. Thank you. Dr. Schur. Um, thank you, Doc. Uh, Dr. Schur. I'm just a regular guy with a regular job, no financial or uh, pharmaceutical or medical background. So if my question is simple, please forgive me, but I, I'm wondering, like we, I think we all agree that a ketogenic lifestyle is uh, a great lifestyle for promoting health and maybe halting the growth of these plaques. Are you aware of any evidence of improvement of coronary health, uh, whether by reduction of plaque or something about through either a pharmaceutical or medical or lifestyle intervention? <laughs> well, so, so that's an interesting question. So yeah, any trials showing improvement in plaque with either lifestyle or pharmaceutical? So, so first, the one that doesn't exist is, is the vegan 
diet as a plaque regressor does not exist, despite what um, vegan advocates say. You know, going back to that uh, Ornish trial, it was a multimodal lifestyle intervention trial um, that involved a vegan diet, but also involved smoking cessation and exercise and stress reduction and, and medical treatment and so many other things. So, um, but that's what proponents of the vegan lifestyle will say was shown to reduce plaque. The method they use for measuring plaque is completely outdated, nobody uses it anymore and has a high degree of variability. So um, I, I don't put any faith in that. But is there any other lifestyle that has proven regression in plaque by a gold standard method? Absolutely not. No, uh, there's, there's, those studies just haven't been done. It doesn't mean they've been proved not to. It just means those studies haven't been done. So instead, that's why we follow surrogate risk markers, and we have to make sure we're following the proper surrogate risk markers, and you know as many as possible, and looking at the whole picture. Um, and that's where CT angiogram, I think, is going to be so incredibly helpful, because now we can get non-invasive tests, we can get better tests um, that are gonna visualize plaque in different degrees, and we can learn more about plaque, and can test lifestyle. So um, I think that's pretty good, but who's gonna, you know, who, people don't wanna pay for lifestyle intervention studies, and that's why most of the studies do come from drug therapy. And yes, statins have been shown with intravascular ultrasound to reduce plaque size, um, to cause plaque regression um, to small degrees, right? It's, it's not, you know, night and day type of changes. But yes, statins have been shown to have that effect. Again, in the average person, in the average population, what, what, what about their metabolic health? What are they doing for lifestyle? None of that's controlled. Just let's take everybody, give half a statin and a half not with cardiovascular disease. So that evidence does exist, yeah. Thank you. And then how does that correlate to outcomes is also a different story because if a plaque reg reg regresses by 0.1 millimeter, does that make it less likely to rupture and cause a heart attack? That's a leap of faith to say one equals the other. My name is Christine. I'm a nutrition advisor and, and then also certified through your diet doctor um, CME course. Excellent. Um, so I focus on nutrition, but there are some people that ask, are there supplements that you would recommend or is it not necessary? But specifically, there's people asking oftentimes about uh, CoQ10 and uh, phospholipids and uh, different metals, copper. Would you say that those are beneficial or just try and get it more from food or is there ones that you would say, yes, try and supplement like with the K. Yeah, yeah, good question. But so, but first, since you brought up, you, you took the Diet Doctor CME course, I, I've got to take that opportunity to jump on it and plug it. Tell your doctor about it. Tell your physician about it. If you're a physician or any healthcare provider, you don't have to be a physician, take it. And because that's, that's part of what we need is, is, um, is more certifications and education for, geared towards not just, you know, our, our echo chamber, our, outside our echo chamber, so people can learn about uh, low carb nutrition and how to use it in their practice. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and it's free. It. And it's free, right? <laughs> Even better. Um, so supplements, CoQ10. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of CoQ10 for people taking statins. Um, you know, statins reduce the production of CoQ10 in your muscles. They can cause muscle symptoms. So to me, it makes sense to supplement with CoQ10. CoQ10. Now the problem is what kind, how much, where's the threshold to get it into the muscles and reverse what's happening. That's really unknown. You know, trials that look at treating people with CoQ10, 100 milligrams for three months, don't show any benefit. Okay, does that mean CoQ10 is worthless if you're on a statin for 10 or 20 years? Um, I don't think so. So, you know, I like higher doses. I usually recommend 300 of ubiquinone. Ubiquinol is, a little, is better absorbed, so you can usually have a lower dose. Is that evidence-based to say 300? No, um, but I think we just need a higher dose than what's been studied and for longer periods of time. Because the last thing I want is someone to take a statin to be healthier and then they're sitting on the couch more because their muscles ache and they don't feel like moving around. Um, in the absence of statins, I mean, I'm not a huge fan personally of CoQ10. There's some data about it in heart failure, um, but I don't think it's like a general supplement. Uh, you need to take it. I also don't love supplements where you can't sort of measure the effect, which unfortunately is a lot of supplements. You know, I love niacin to treat small dense LDL or treat LP little a because you're measuring a certain thing and you can see, does it have an effect? Does it not have an effect? If it doesn't, you stop it. 
Um, you know, other supplements, you can talk about vitamin D and omega-3s and K2, and there's so many different supplements, and I think they all have a role. It's just hard to say, you know, who should take what in general, but they all, they, they have a role in the right situation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you. My name's Angie. I'm a general internist and weight loss doctor. Um, I have a patient that's like 73, and I followed her for 15 years. She's normal weight. Her LDL was always 150, but her HDL was always 65. Over time, though, it crept up. It got into the 165, 170 range, and I did an advanced lipid profile, and it was sort of equivocal. So we got a calcium scoring, and in my institution, it reported in the 90th percentile of high plaque. So I sent her to cardiology, and they did an angiogram, and the, wow. the vessels were clean. The, the, the calcium was not in the lumen. Yeah. So my, my question there, they, they put her on a statin still. Is that indicated or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it is a bit of a knee-jerk reflex that calcium equals statin because calcium, coronary calcium means you have vascular disease and anybody with vascular disease needs a statin. That is becoming accepted as the standard of care. Whether that's the right thing for each individual is a completely different story, a completely different question. And, you know, impossible to answer without all the information. But, yeah, I mean, that is, that has become accepted within cardiology that one, um, that, that presence of calcium can equal a statin, especially if it's in above the 75th percentile, because that mm -hmm. is in the guidelines, um, or if it's above an absolute number of 100, because that is in the guidelines. Um, but, again, whether that is correct for each patient is a completely different question. Yeah. No, and she would, you know, a CT angiogram would have been a much better test there than an invasive angiogram anyway. Uh, well, she, she was having, I think after she got the test back, she started thinking, am I having chest pain? It yeah. turned out to be acid Sorry reflux. Suggestion. But, but a similar question, uh, I had a patient that had a CT scan. Back up. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, all right. <laughs> Here's the perfect example who loves, who actually follows Doug's, Doug's <laughs> suggestion. She's Last like Doug's, question. <laughs> Doug's best friend here. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question. And hopefully this one will be a lot more fun. <laughs> Knowing what you know about metabolic risk factors for heart disease, what would be your dream risk calculator and ah. when can we expect it? <laughs> the dream risk calculator. That's a great question. Yeah, so I, I didn't show the, the traditional cardiovascular risk calculator, but they're, they're very simplistic. It's LDL, HDL, blood pressure, age. Um, whether you have diabetes, as if it's like blood sugar is a binary thing, um, whether you smoke, as if, you know, smoking one cigarette is the same as smoking 100 cigarettes. So it's clearly a, a poor risk calculator, but sort of the best we have right now. I would want to know ApoB rather than LDL. I'd rather want to know remnants. I'd want to know, you know, insulin resistance scores rather than just diabetes. I think all of those um, really factor in uh, much more strongly. Like that, that slide from the, the Women's Health Initiative, th those were much more powerful powerful predictors in that population than was just LDL or even just blood pressure. So um, I would love to see those in a risk calculator. And when I have free time, I'll come up with it. How about that? As for <laughs> Eric Westman, Durham, North Carolina. I've hey, heard Brent. of you. Hi, Eric. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for what you do. Um, you. Did you see the, I think, a very important paper earlier this year by uh, Dugani et al. in JAMA Cardiology? Um, I don't remember Arthur, well, authors. Be a little more <laughs> yeah, specific. Well, I want to make a, a point of it because uh, it was the incident coronary heart disease in women, meaning the first event. So, and it, it's an outcome study with you know twenty thousand odd women, and they have a great figure showing the predictors, and you line up all the predictors and their. LPIR calculation from the NMR lipo profile was the one that clearly was more predictive of the first heart attack in women. And then diabetes was yeah. prominent, then heart, hypertension, smoking, BMI, 
HDL, and then way down here, it was almost not even significant, was that pesky little LDL. Yeah, so I'm sure you got a, a very important phone call or something during my talk and had to go get it. <laughs> I, did. I showed that slide. You did, okay. Yeah, from the Women's Health Initiative, from the 21-year the follow-up. That's Dugani et al., thank okay. you. Okay, yeah, yeah, yes. so absolutely, yeah. And that, I love that slide, I love that study. I think it's so instructive. Um, about the importance of metabolic health and putting LDL in perspective, and putting LDL in perspective first to ApoB, but then more importantly to metabolic health, because those far outweighed the risks of LDL when predicting future risk over that 21-year um, period. So yeah, I, I, thank you for bringing that up again. Well, of I course, think it's very important. one study is fine, but you need a replication. So I urge people who have control of these data sets to, to look at a similar kind of uh, predictive um, model without forcing LDL in the model first. And that's what's yeah. happened historically, because LDL was thought to be so important. When you don't assume it is important, it's not so important when you're looking at these other <laughs> things. Now, the right. problem is it's only women, and there were only four, I think, 4% uh, outcome. So this is, I mean, I see this as an important model of what to do, but not definitive yet. Correct. That I think that, that's view. a great point. That's yeah. a great point about uh, replicating studies, understanding limitations of studies and their general applicability. Um, and yeah, we need. I, I'm sorry, I, I did have an important phone call. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Very good. Um, thanks for taking my second question. This is semi related to the other one. Uh, if you have a patient that has a CT scan for the chest, rule out PE or whatever, and that uh, comes back showing incidental calcification in the LAD. They have normal cholesterol, they're not hypertensive. Should they be on a statin? That's my other question. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, clinical questions like that are incredibly difficult to answer in this type of scenario. I mean, it should put, put them on your radar screen as someone who needs further evaluation. So do they get a more dedicated calcium score um, so you can quantify it and see what their, you know, what percentile they are and what the number is. Um, you put it in their overall risk risk assessment, their, you know, whether they get a statin or not. I think, unfortunately, questions like that are, um, people think there's a simple answer, and there isn't. Yeah. And, and, and if you think there's a simple answer as a physician, then you're not digging deep enough and you're not asking enough questions. And that's where I, I think the mindset really needs to change to say it's not X equals Y, you know, not calcium equals statin, but calcium equals, okay, you've got my attention. Now let's really figure out what's going on and let's really dig into it and start asking the right questions. Thank you. So if, if you have kind of a middle-aged person, maybe some type 2 diabetes and, uh, um, and they get a CAC and it's positive, it's over, definitely over 100, you put them on a low-carb diet, everything gets better, all the lipid markers get, oh, sorry, and then you put them on a statin at that time. And then you put them on a low-carb intervention, everything gets better, and they ask you, can I take my statin off now? Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you counsel them? <laughs> oh, the questions on statins. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, so... That, that's, a, that's an impossible question to answer. So again, you, you just need more information um, about that. So is statin the right treatment in that scenario to begin with? Um, you know, maybe a CT angiogram is a better test to see and to follow. What's their metabolic health? Um, what's their lifestyle? Those are much more important questions to me. Do you stay on a statin or not? It depends what your goal is for treating them with a statin. Are you treating to a goal LDL? Are you treating to plaque regression or plaque stabilization? Um, if so, you need to measure what your goal is. Or do you just believe statin for life in that situation? And if that's what you believe, then you don't, you don't take it away. But if you, if you want to think about taking it away, you need to ask yourself, what am I trying to accomplish with this statin? How do I measure it? How do I see if I'm having the effect I want or not? And then, and then make the decision whether to treat or not. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. He's back. That's right. I, I figured, you know, since, uh, since just about everybody cleared out, I was just going to fit in just this one last thing. I have a confession. When you posted the Diet Doctor video where you were talking about how LDL typically goes down, you were uh, using Ethan Weiss's study. Given you didn't actually mention that that was in the aggregate, and of course in the aggregate we're going to have a lot more who have obesity and diabetes and so forth, 
that was one of my problems with the meta analyses. But then when you did the video on it, I almost did like a tweet thread or a, a response video or something along those lines, because I did think we need to make that distinction. I think at this point, yeah. while I know it's a generality, I do think that it is generally true that if you are a severely type 2 diabetic, uh, obese, it's more likely than not that your cholesterol won't change very significantly, or if it does increase, it'll be very marginal, such as what we see with the Verda population. But likewise, and I actually say this to people who say that I'm considering going on a low carb diet and I'm very concerned that my cholesterol will go way up. And I say, if you're concerned about that and I can see that you are likely metabolically healthy and lean, it's very likely. And therefore, technically, I do think we should make the stratification for that population. I do worry that that title kind of felt a little clickbaity to some degree, and I think a lot of people might see it and be like, oh, okay, so we know from the meta-analysis, that's just unlikely. I feel yeah. like we do know of the population for which it would be likely. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and, and thank you for making it, that any of these trials, meta-analysis, even the individual trials like the Verda trial, the, the, the data reported is the average. And, but when you look at the individual plots, some LDL goes up, some goes down, some doesn't change, so on average, it doesn't change. I guess I present it in that way because of what's being presented on the other side by cardiologists and lipidologists that you cannot go on a low carb diet because your LDL will go up, period. You know, that's, that's what's being promoted. Um, so maybe I do go too far the other way to say, no, it doesn't. Look, the, the data says it doesn't. But yes, in some people it does because it does go both ways and there is individual variation. But on average in those studies, it doesn't. So that is a very good point. So I have a proposal. You could just do a part two. <laughs> Just a thought. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> I got to think. I don't think I've ever said no to that question when you've asked it, Dave. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay. So oh, we, we're actually running out of, sorry. Out of time. Question. But I, I, maybe let's take one. If there's a question from Rick. Take one question Rick, from the live stream, yeah. If Rick asked a question from the live stream, I got to answer that first. I promised him I'd answer his questions. Oh, let me ask one <laughs> from Dylan, and then I'll look for Rick's over okay. too. Uh, Rick would like to know, um, do you have any concerns about excess lin linoleic acid and oxidized LDL? Ah, linoleic acid, the hornet's nest. Let me kick the hornet's nest here. So mm -hmm. first and foremost, uh, Diet Doctor podcast. We just did a, um, a podcast where I interviewed six different experts to get their opinions on vegetable oils and linoleic acid. Uh, do I have any concerns about oxidation from linoleic acid? Yes, I, I think the mechanistic data is very concerning. Is it concerning enough that it impacts the average person's health in a negative way? I don't know that we have outcome data to, actually let me rephrase that, we do not have outcome data to suggest that that is the case. Does that mean we know everything about it and we have all the data to answer the question? No. Um, so do I eat uh, any vegetable oils or cook with linoleic acid in any way? Absolutely not. Do I recommend any of my patients do it? Absolutely not. Do I recommend most people do it? Absolutely not. Can I stand here and say we have strong clinical evidence to show it is dangerous? Absolutely not. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there, um, but I think we have to be honest what the evidence says. And the mechanistic data is concerning. Um, good quality clinical data so far does not necessarily reflect that, but that doesn't mean you should run out and then eat it with impunity. impunity. But you know, if you're gonna eat out a couple days a week and get a little bit of seed oil when you eat out, for most people, that's not gonna even move the needle. Um, if you're guzzling it and specifically cooking with it because you think it's a health food because it lowers LDL by 3% or something, then I think you're in the wrong boat there. So that, that, that's my take on it. But my, my real answer is listen to the podcast because there's some, it's good to get the different variety of answers um, from the six experts I had on there.